Hello and welcome to the seventh lecture, Molecular Dynamics Force Fields. And uh, we are continuing our theoretical discussions on molecular dynamics theory, especially on the interatomic potentials. <laughs> so previously we have talked about a very popular uh, potential that is Tarshov, that is a bond order potential. We have uh, introduced uh, you to uh, empirical or Leonard Jones potential, semi-empirical or EM potential and Tarshov or a, that is a bond order potential to show you how differently you can define uh, your system in terms of potential energy. And now we will continue our discussion on the force fields or interatomic potentials. This is just a flashback of the previous uh, Tertiary potential lecture where we have defined, <laughs> where we have described how to define potential energy uh, in terms of uh, not only the position, but also the bond order. Now, now we have uh, an overall idea of what is a force field. A force field is uh, the very definition of the system in terms of potential energy, the energy state of the system. And uh, there is a governing equation that is an energy function. That's what we have been showing in terms of uh, functional form. And it is required for any system you want to build. Let's say you want to uh, make a protein system or a biomolecule system or a polymer system. You have to define the governing equation, how they behave and interact with each other. And uh, let's say uh, uh, you want to define the whole system, right? Uh, in the simplistic definitions of pair potentials or semi-empirical um, methods, you can see that we have uh, captured the system in terms of the position of the atoms or electron density or uh, a bond order. So we wanted to capture the behavior uh, of the system. But uh, if you want to define a whole system, you have to actually define several terms to capture the whole system. Let's say uh, if there is a polymer or a protein, there are bonds, uh, there are angles, there are uh, dihedrals, that is uh, angles that are not in the same plane, and also some non bonded interactions for charge, that is Coulombic interaction, or for position like Van der Waals interaction. So if you want to define the whole system realistically, you have to write uh, terms uh, corresponding to these uh, parameters like bonds, angles, dihedrals. And when you do that in combination, uh, it is called a force field. So as an example, uh, a very parameterized model uh, worked, uh, which works well for uh, biomolecules is called charm uh, force field or charm potentials. It's uh, potential energy, uh, previously we have seen E, but uh, U, uh, now we are seeing V, but is the same as the potential energy. You can see that there are several terms that are defined to uh, capture the whole system. There is a bond term that actually uh, defines uh, the whole system's bonds in terms of uh, harmonic springs. And then there is an angle term, which talks about the angles that, it, that are uh, existent between atoms. There are also dihedral terms, improper terms, Uri Bradley terms. You can uh, search for all of them and a documentation page uh, from LAMPS or uh, a charm force field will uh, pop up and you can go through the details of the theoretic, uh, theoretical description. And uh, there is also non-bonded interaction, as you have mentioned that there is a uh, uh, electrostatic, and there is uh, for positional uh, attraction and repulsion terms, uh, as you have seen. So now uh, we have introduced you to the simplistic versions of pair potentials so that you can understand. But in reality, uh, when you define a force field or interacting potential, these many things you have to take into consideration. So it will be very convenient if you know the names of the popular ones uh, for uh, classical uh, classical molecular dynamics, where the atomistic level of interactions are taken into consideration. Uh, charm, amber, opalis, chromos, these are very popular ones. 
Now, uh, for example, charms, uh, charm is used, charm or ember, these are used for uh, biomolecules. There are also uh, sometimes your system uh, is very big and you cannot actually capture all the atomistic uh, interactions. That's why you have to coarse grain them. That is, uh, let's say a set of atoms is considered as one big atom or a seed. Uh, this way you can also make a force field. For example, uh, in this way, martini force field works. Sometimes you want to uh, define, uh, you want to capture the reactions that is uh, existent in a force field. There's a, uh, there's a typo here, it's actually reactive. So uh, in this regard, a reacts if a force field is a very popular one. So why so many force fields? Why don't we uh, come into the middle ground and define everything uh, with, a sim uh, with a single equation? Because, of, uh, because there are tons of different behaviors and structures and functionalities of the systems. Uh, the way one type of molecule behaves, the other type of molecule behaves uh, uh, does not behave this, this way. So we have to come up with so many functional forms and we have to actually uh, fine tune or tailor the uh, parameters and optimize for a particular type of system. That's why you will see that sometimes uh, some force field, uh, some force fields work for metals, some works for polymers, some works for alloys, and some simplistic ones do not work well for uh, many systems. And sometimes you can see that uh, for biomolecules, there are uh, specific parameterized uh, force fields which do not work for other systems. Sometimes uh, some force fields will work for membrane systems, some will work for protein systems. And that's why you have to actually change the terms or the change the functional forms or the parameters or constants associated with them. And as a result, uh, you have to come up with so many force fields. And sometimes you have to also improve over the previous version of a force field. So uh, you have to be very careful which version you're using and which terms they're taking into consideration. So in terms of underlying math, what is going on uh, in a force field, what you are doing is that you are actually solving Newton's equation as you already know, and you are constantly performing an integration for the whole system and their solution, this kind of, uh, this solution of this, uh, this integration actually gives you the trajectories of the atoms that is uh, present in a system. So this is kind of a functional form how you discretize a solution uh, in a system, uh, but I'm not going into many details. Uh, because at this level, a uh, high level introduction is uh, important. And that will give you a sense of ease uh, to understand the material. And also the documentation of the theoretical background is very, uh, very detailed uh, if you search for it, like how uh, a force field is working in terms of solving the uh, underlying equations. But for now, uh, I believe that this is uh, an appropriate level of extent of detail uh, that I'm going through. And uh, as you can see that you are solving these equations for uh, so many times. Uh, let's say you are running an, a one nanosecond of simulation and you are solving this equation to get the atom trajectory uh, so many times. You are solving it every few uh, femtoseconds or every picosecond. So, in order to optimize this, in order to calculate this uh, correctly and optimize this for your system, a very big system contains several thousand atoms, uh, there are several ways or algorithms to do it. For example, Verlet or velocity Verlet algorithms, which uh, I'm not going into detail, but uh, it's good to know uh, what to search for when you, when you want to know uh, more detail about the underlying map. So long story short, in order to get the trajectories of atoms, the movements or behaviors or interactions of the atoms, you are actually solving Newton's equation. Uh, as we have um, 
as we have mentioned in a previous lecture, uh, you can uh, uh, revise it. Uh, we have actually shown what goes on uh, in, a, in a molecular dynamic simulation. And uh, how often, uh, as we have talked about that, we are, uh, we're discretizing the problem, we're solving the problem, uh, we're solving the equation uh, at a defined interval, how often are we solving? That, uh, the answer to these is uh, the definition of the time step, how uh, many times or how fine-tuned you have to do it in terms of solving the uh, equations uh, related to uh, the molecular dynamics. Uh, you can see that atomic vibration in lattice it's actually 10 to the power minus 14 seconds. That is uh, a few uh, femtoseconds, tens of femtoseconds. And that's why if you want to capture uh, the movement of the atoms or the behavior of the atoms, you have to actually solve them uh, for 10 to the power minus 14 uh, or less. That is 10 to the power minus 15. Let's say you have to solve the equation every femtosecond, 10 to the power minus 15 seconds. Uh, in order to capture what is happening at the atomic level in the lattice. So uh, the answer to the question, how often do we solve, uh, is, uh, it, it is generally uh, in line with the atomic vibration, uh, the frequency of atomic vibration in lattice, uh, that is uh, one femtosecond generally in order to capture. If you solve it uh, at a bigger time scale, let's say you are solving at every one second, then you are not actually capturing anything because uh, by the time you have solved it, uh, solved it, uh, it has actually vibrated so many times that you will miss the details. So in order to capture the detail of what is happening in the system, you have to solve, uh, uh, you have to set the time step of solving uh, according to the atomic vibration or whatever phenomenon you are trying to capture. So now we have gone through the atomistic detail of the molecular dynamic setting. Now in the next lecture, we'll uh, talk about the molecular dynamics ensembles. That is uh, the holistic definition of a system uh, that goes on in a molecular dynamic simulation. Thanks. <laughs>